And hello, everybody. Getting some uh, last minute stuff done here. Let's see. Here's the link. I'm sending uh, the link to tonight's program to Amber, but I see that she is already with us. And I need to turn up my headphones a little bit. As usual, we've come online a couple of minutes early because that's how the system works within your uh, member community. Uh, welcome, everybody, and good evening. Uh, we won't really get seriously underway here until eh, at least another minute or two because we do have uh, people coming online right now as we speak. And I am watching for the chief scientist to show up in our list of participants because he, of course, tonight is our guest of honor, who we, we will be talking with over the next hour or more, maybe a little bit more, depending on how much you guys want to participate, about uh, these these wonderful books from your planetary society written by bruce betts uh who is um uh not just our chief scientist but lately our chief author it also seems um <clears throat> he has been really cranking stuff out he of course has a lot of books uh totally under his own uh his own byline his own authorship uh, but uh, he's uh, done much more than that, uh, and uh, we will talk about that, these books, and we will talk about pretty much anything else that you folks want to talk to, well, talk about, I should say, uh, as soon as we bring him in. And if you are just joining us, I see a lot of people coming online right now. Um, we're just getting underway. Came on a couple of minutes early, just because that's how the system works. And uh, I'm keeping an eye out for Bruce. Oh, there he is. Hey, Bruce, I'm going to promote you right now. So I've just invited Bruce to come up, and hopefully he'll accept that invitation. I haven't said anything too insulting yet, I don't think. Um, <laughs> welcome again to all of you back to another live event in your member community. It's going to be a busy month here in the community. We've got a lot coming up. Um, including this coming Saturday, when I hope a lot of you will tune in at 8 p.m. Pacific when we go live from Mount Wilson under the dome of the 60-inch telescope built by George Ellery Hale. At one time, one of the largest telescopes in the world. There he is. Check it out. Hey, Matt. We're in the we're in the solar system. Wear in the official planetary study bowling shirt. Yes, and I, I should have done that. That would have been a good one, too. But I did do that for the last one of these that I did. So thank you for uh, for dressing up for the occasion. And look at all those fun books behind you. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't, couldn't even fit them on all the, the frames I had. And I've even got one here to show you up close and personal, of course. And I can't see my Take page. a look. Take a look. There they are. All so, seven planets of our solar system. Uh, why why seven because i let my grandson pick oh. one of the books i said i'd give him the rest when we finish this <laughs> event uh ben he chose jupiter not too surprisingly and so uh, yeah i'm afraid tonight for me there are only seven in the solar system welcome wow no i, I was like no really we did earth <laughs> there's, there's an earth book. <laughs> there is there's one right? book for every uh, uh there it is, every right one there. of them planets there it is oh, there it so is yeah, a little bit out of focus, thanks to my AI-driven camera. And uh, so this will also be out of focus. Maybe if I put nice. it right in front of my face. Yes, that works. Mine. Look, there it it's is. The classic there is... Matt Bruce filming, mm -hmm. uh, filming, recording planetary radio at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> On the beach in Coronado down here in uh, San Diego. Uh, which, uh, down was, your uh, way. Down, down my way. I go there all the time, as a matter of fact. So um, I, I told everybody that we can talk about life, the universe, and, their, and everything, and they can just throw questions at us. You know where to do that. You do it in the chat, everybody, uh, and uh, uh, feel free. And by the way, if you are not joining us live, whether you're a member who couldn't join us live or you're not yet a member of the Planetary Society, you may be watching us on the Planetary Society website, planetary.org, or maybe you found us on our website, uh, sorry, on our YouTube channel, which is quite popular, well over 100,000 uh, followers, subscribers now. Uh, we, uh, we invite you to explore. We also invite you to come on back to the website 
and look at what of all of our members, uh, all the ways that they benefit, including uh, their ability to become members of this online member community and enjoy these events live, not just uh, on tape, as we still say, strangely enough. And we are is it already... Live or is it... What's that? Is it live or is it... In Memorex? <laughs> A little bit of advertising uh, uh, jingles stuck in your head from decades you, ago. Do you remember there was a woman, she had this really interesting look, and she was the model for one of the Memorex ads. And uh, uh, it was quite famous because I think they were the ones where they had like, like they were sitting in front of speakers and they were being overpowered, almost blown over by the power of the tape, which is ridiculous, of course. But I actually met that woman once. She had, uh, I, I, I. You married her, didn't you? I didn't know. <laughs> no, oh, I married. I married another powerful story. woman. But yeah, it would have yes, been. But but anyway, I don't know. Some of you out there may remember that. Um, let's talk about the real, the sort of excuse we have for bringing you on in what is nominally a book club event, which is these books. Dude, an excuse. There are eight books here about the planets. There's, they're real, I think. Yeah, but calling it a book club event. I mean, because really, I want to do much more than that. It's a have. books club event. I want to have you. I see what you mean. I well, you're have, saying I'm, I'm better. Better than <laughs> you're more Anyone. than one. I don't know about better. More than. You're, right you're, right. You, you might be more than. You're definitely more than. You're, you might be better than. I'm definitely um, more than I used to be. See, folks, I told you this would be fun. And when we did it for Planetary Radio, it usually wasn't longer than, you know, six, seven, eight minutes. Now we get to We're do going it like eight or ten hours, hour. I think. <laughs> so tell us uh, about the genesis of these books, beginning with, at the beginning, with uh, Mercury. The very first uh, and innermost. Oh, it planet. actually goes goes beyond. Before that, once upon a time, there is a book publisher named Lerner. No, not spelled like that. Spelled L-E-R-N-E-R, -E -E and they talked to planetary society people. <laughs> and the combined power of our power of the solar system in space and their power of reaching out to children uh, to teach them good stuff and happy stuff. And there was much discussion of uh, what would be produced. And then uh, then I was handed, uh, here, go produce this. No, not quite. <laughs> but but uh, there, the one before this is Casting Shadows, which is about eclipses, which was released in time for the last total solar eclipse. We just had an annual solar eclipse. I mean, we didn't, but people very far south did. Um, and so uh, the, there's a book for every, uh, these, they're so thin, but they take so much time. And I've chosen pictures with care. Do you like the pictures, Matt? I love the pictures. I absolutely love the pictures. And there are some things that I had never seen before, like really Galileo's drawings of the phases of Venus, which I mentioned uh, in a text message here. I'm looking for it now, uh, even though it will look like <laughs> garbage held up here. But anyway, it's it, and I learned quite a bit, and uh, and and they're not even targeted at my advanced age group. There's the Galileo drawings right there. Um, <laughs> Let me check. Is, are you sure? I, I have, Library of Congress, uh, blah blah blah. Uh -huh. Grades two to three, ages seven to ten, and ages sixty to eighty. Uh, oh, so grades supposed to be retired, but isn't. So I'm just slightly aged out of the first group. Uh, out of the uh, just slightly, the, the just slightly. I, I will tell I you, it's a much broader, it's a much broader cross section. I always like to believe that there are, including good. adults, who pick them up and and learn something. And certainly from other books I wrote at a higher level, uh, but still for children and then young adults, teens, um, that adults get a lot out of it. At least the adults I know, and um, I don't know, it, it, my, it, it's nice. But the kids, my my eight, kids my eight year old too. grandson had a great time because I let him page through all of them while he picked out uh, Jupiter nice. was the one I allowed him to take away uh, until he gets the rest of the set. And he loved it. He just ate them up. Hey. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because uh, he's my grandson, but he, he is, uh, he's a space geek in training. So uh, these were well, absolutely yeah. perfect for him. But it's true. Grandpa. I enjoy them uh, enormously as well, and they're full of all <laughs> kinds of wonderful illustrations. 
uh, as yeah. Bruce said, but also really, really good information and very up to date. Uh, yes. I, uh, I, there's a lot of stuff that's uh, quite current in here. There's actually some stuff from the future that I put in. <laughs> right. Talk about that. Speaking yeah. of the future, there are more books that are going to be coming down the pike, just so you know. Tell us. So, uh, we, we got the eight planets here, but we've got the next set of four. We've got sun, moon, the moon, and uh, asteroids and comets, mm -hmm. and dwarf planets. And then and now I'm just finishing the original writing, and they'll be editing for a while for two more, even farther down the line. I don't know. That's probably a secret. One is a biography of Matt Kaplan. Oh, well, that should be interesting, since you'll entirely <laughs> take it. Uh, Mark Dunning once says he's already got oh, Mercury and Venus so far. What grade does the writing target, and did you work with teachers to choose the level of language used? Well, you already mentioned a couple of fake age ranges, but but really, who who no, are they? The, the, the others were the others were the real age ranges, <laughs> so ages seven to ten, uh, but maybe a little broader in the grades. Well, no, I guess less so. Two to three, so it's kind of grades two to four, one to four, one to three, seven to ten, six to eleven, but officially seven to ten. And uh, I worked with editors, uh, not with teachers per se, but I worked with editors for whom this is their job at Learner. So they uh, took my initial shot at targeting those age ranges and uh, made it more targeted for those age ranges because I can't help myself sometimes. So sentences got shorter, words uh, got replaced when doable. I mean, they're great. Uh, they're great about we go back and forth. So there's some words you just you're kind of stuck with and it rate raises the computer determined level but there are others that you can swap around so uh the editors were definitely a, a key key players in in this as well as the staff at learner and the illustrators and the art layout and so i was writer guy and provider of uh images and, and the rest is everyone else there I should, and, I should. and people on our staff, a lot of people on our staff working to make all, the, all this happen. I mean, like a lot of people between the initial phases to the keeping things on track or trying to keep me on track. It's not easy. I do want to point out, which maybe a lot of people don't fully realize, uh, that as chief scientist, one of your duties is to regularly review a lot of the content that emerges from Others on the staff, not me, of course, uh, but but uh, to review it. Because they don't let you write that, anymore. Yeah, pretty much. No, <laughs> not true. But <laughs> is that agreement? See, if you lie, the dogs get upset. Um, they do. They do. They keep me out. You, you review most, if not all, of the content, uh, the, the science, the planetary science in particular, that emerges from, you know, our, our very talented and very knowledgeable staff. So you do get to review that stuff. It's an important I, I, step in, I, our, yeah, in our process. Yeah, I review a lot of it, and I'm the science editor for the planetary report, which just means, with all these things, looking through and making sure things are as accurate as I can make them. And, uh, and we also have now ASA, uh, stall on on board and so he's doing some of the review but uh then we we do different internal reviews and that that's mostly reviewing for scientific accuracy and clarity um and there we're we're writing towards our very very smart members uh so um, i actually try to make bigger words out of other words but the <laughs> other editors get involved and make that stop so it occurs to me that also that uh, for a lot of years there, maybe since Lou Friedman left, you were the only PhD on staff. Am I right about this is that? True. But now I mean we have we have plenty on the on the board and the advisory yes. council just to be but clear. on staff. Uh, but on until, staff, yes, I was the only PhD until Asa Stahl's recent arrival. Because nope, he is officially, PhD. I am the only PhD. Uh, I refuse to acknowledge his. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Asa. No, yes, we have another PhD on staff. Yeah, uh, he's mostly kidding, Dr. Stahl, who is a, a certified right, astrophysicist. Doctor. So, yeah. <clears throat> and you see his byline many, many times uh, already no, in, his, in his still fairly short tenure uh, with the Planetary Society. We are very happy to have him. 
Um, talk about how these books can be had by people. I mean, a lot of them are going into libraries, right? Right. So learners, learner publications, their main focus for their market is to get it into school libraries. And so, ah, sorry, picture Asa just popped up on the chat. Um, I see that. Man, I'm just taking a shot. That is not That's Amber, by the way, here. Amber Trujillo doing her That is not story. Amber. <laughs> no, Amber does Amber. not have a beard. But it's Amber who's posting all this, these great links. Ah. Who, she always does such a good job uh, backing us up uh, with everything that we talk about. In fact, there's your Eclipse book above there in that thread. So anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yes. and you have a real question. Um, Learner and libraries. Learner and libraries. Oh, it's alliteration. Uh, yeah, so they, they really push this into the library market. They go to things that I, of course, exist, but I never thought about, librarian conferences and the like, and really get them out into school libraries. So there, there are two uh, bindings of this, the one I've got here, which is a hardback, but it's even more than a hardback. It is a library binding, so it's supposed to be particularly durable, which is why when you wonder, why are the hardbacks quite so expensive? It's because they have kids and dogs have trouble ripping these apart. Don't ask why I know that. Um, just kidding. Uh, and uh, and <laughs> <laughs> come on, I left it wide open. I didn't jump in that time. <laughs> I know it confused me so much. <laughs> so, but there's also uh, the paperback version you've got, uh, which is uh, designed to be torn apart by dogs and children. And no, it's not. It's also very good. You can get them either from uh, Learner Publications directly from their website, L-E-R-N-E-R, -E -E and you can also get them on Amazon. Uh, and there's a little flow challenge right now with um, the uh, availability of, of some of them uh, because, uh, you know, I assume because they're so popular and people are waiting for autographs and from you, un ironically. Um, it's too many dumb jokes, Matt. I just, I store them all up and they just, I, I see you and I just become a pile of non uh, content. That's right. You don't, just go with it. Just go with it. I'd have given that last joke a six or a seven. Really? Yeah, Out of ten? No. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, so, yeah. So uh, you can get, those are the two primary places online, Learner or uh, Learner website or the uh, Amazon website. And if things are out of things, they will be getting more in over the coming months. It'll be good. When do those next books uh, come out? The other, the next four? The next four come out somewhere between the very beginning of the year hmm. of 2025 in the spring of 2025. I'm actually clarifying that, but it'll be in the first months of 20, first three months of 2025. And then the next ones, uh, I'm actually clarifying, it's either fall of 25 or spring of 26. The last two, which we didn't discuss, one which is amazingly similar to something you called random space facts, but it's not called that. And just dealing with size and scale and all the different analogies of, you know, involving, uh, dogs and chickens and uh, balls and to, to teach you about the solar system and its scale. Uh, and then I know that sounds uh, really odd. And then one on the search for life in the universe. And I am looking forward to that. That will complete my current planned nine, six, 15 books. Wow. And that's why, I mean, over the last many, many months, when I have uh, asked, you know, called and said, can Bruce come out to play? I was always told, no, he's writing books. <laughs> he's got another deadline. <laughs> yes. And but again, it it's, feels silly because I spend so much time and then like, especially the paperback, it comes and I just go, oh my God, it's so small. It's just right is in my opinion it's just um, right thanks this, Papa Bear. the fact that the planetary society is so yeah. devoted to putting these out uh is is i think evidence that we are taking very seriously yes. uh our devotion to young people 
and their we are and, uh, and this is also tied i've also been working on the the content again not the layout or all the other wonderful things our staff and our our contractors are doing for planetary academy which is our youth membership program that people can get involved with you can find on our website and uh and sign up for it where they get packages with a booklet and other pages and goodies to uh, study planets along the way. So we've been doing planets and sun and moon and all those good things. We, it's a three year, three years total, uh, done kind of a year at a time. It has a wonderful logo that has just appeared in your chat window. And uh, it is, um, it's good stuff. And uh, so I, my brain gets confused, but I, content goes flying between these <laughs> these two areas and uh, and it works out pretty well if I had had my wits about me I could have borrowed uh, one of the planetary Academy mailings packages from my grandson or step granddaughter uh, because they are both very happy subscribers and uh, oh, good. they love it they just eat it up as soon as it arrives in the house they pretty much complete it the first day. <laughs> so I'm sure they it was monthly or weekly, because uh, yeah. they they just they just blow through everything because it's really fun. Uh, it is, and uh, I I could pull samples, uh, but I'd have to vanish and dig around, and it wouldn't be pretty. That's all right. Yeah, we got other stuff to talk about anyway. Perfectly <laughs> unwrinkled shirt. You are not new with even this series or the Eclipse book. And the difference this time is that these are officially part of your these are, planetary society right. duties right these are planetary society books they're branded planetary society along with learner books and they are planetary society series uh designed to get in and work into schools and elsewhere and educate and excite kids about space exploration and all part of our growing youth uh program and youth membership program this is beyond membership whereas the previous six books were I did separately from the Planetary Society with awareness and working together, but not as a Planetary Society activity. So yes, that is the publishing difference. And you can find those as well. I mean, go to the usual places and just search on Bruce Betts and uh, you'll see those uh, books pop up too. Um, yes, 10? That was, was a book popping up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was better. Maybe, that was better. I thought maybe book. it was more books than I thought. I thought maybe there were ten books that you wrote before uh, starting this stuff for the society. I did, and but they're all tell-all books about Matt Kaplan. That Wouldn't didn't sell very well, did it? Uh, no, because I told the actual truth. I'll be doing uh, another one. I think people are waiting for the movie. Um, this is just a piece of your overall duties. We've talked about this before with you, of course. Now we kind of shift into the planetary people series that we do here in the uh, in the community. But you know, talk about what you do as chief scientist. But you're also raising First, your hand. Can I ask one question of you? Of course. Yeah. You said people are waiting for the Matt Kaplan movie. Who would you like to play Matt Kaplan in the movie? That is a really good question. Let me think about that. Well, you, you think about that and come back to it. Job. Meanwhile, yeah. I am. Uh, the chief scientist at the Planetary Society, which we talked about the review aspect and the fulfilling one of our values. I'm the, uh, uh, the the person trying to make sure everything's scientifically, technically right, which is uh, one of the things we strive for. And uh, I also manage our grants programs. And so uh, we will have uh, our now two regular grants programs, one Shoemaker Neo or Neo Grants, which is for really advanced amateur, semi-pro uh, astronomers who are tracking, characterizing, and even discovering near-Earth asteroids, protecting the planet, saving the world. And then our newer STEP grant program, the Science and Technology Empowered by the Public, hey, that's you. Uh, and that is a larger program, wide open to any of our core enterprises uh, that we work on from uh, exploring planets to planetary defense with asteroids or search for life out out there and uh, and that's going great so I work on those and then there was that little light sail thing that uh, in I took was the program manager for the last few years of it and then the uh, the 
the camera guy. Yeah, the photographer, the guy who took the pictures from LightSail, which are, uh, among others, you can't really make it out, it's out of focus, on the calendar that's uh, hanging on the wall behind me. Before we dive a little bit further into some of that, like particularly the grant programs, Amber is so on top of it. Planetary Society is how she shows up there in the uh, thread. Ooh, drop your actor recommendations of who can play Matt Kaplan in a movie. <laughs> and, and you have, Craig says, Richard Dreyfus. I would hope a little, slightly younger, not much younger, Richard Dreyfus. But, um, you know, I when I saw American Graffiti, when it first came out, because I'm that old, uh, I, I so identified with the character that Richard Dreyfus played. And I continued in, in a lot of his early movies. So you are dead on, Craig. But then we also got from Mark, J.K. Simmons, who oh, I dude, never, I, that would have been I picture cool. you just watched a, a, a parody on YouTube of Whiplash. And I just picture you as uh, ah. you just yelling at the people, you know, your guests on this show, because that's, now, obviously, J.K. Simmons is extremely talented and could play a much closer you, but that's what amused me. <laughs> I, I got, I, I don't know, he's a lot taller than me, I think, but he's also a really nice guy. I met him uh, uh, some time ago, a few years ago. He came to a performance at a theater run by some people I know, and uh, just a, a lovely, uh, lovely man, and uh, not long after that, won his Oscar. Uh, okay, it was actually, actually technically... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Not whiplash parody, but anyway, that's that's fine. Just so now Amber, and Amber has flashed up a link to the Step Grants program. Okay, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Uh, science and technology enabled by the public. Step. Uh, we, we we debated that one, but uh, we went with empowered. Empowered by the public. I make that mistake every time. Uh, it okay. was, they were both finalists in the internal discussion of. The, uh, the d details of the acronym, which is all Empowered important. is much better, much better. Well, thank you. I can't remember if I suggested it. Step was mine. How's it going? Uh, what, what's the status? It is going great. Uh, we awarded, uh, we've had two rounds of awards that we did, and uh, they each were to two different groups, and all of them have progressed. We had the uh, you know, the in Serbia, the University of Belgrade, they did a very uh, impressive, to use my technical term, crazed modeling of the orbits of certain near Earth asteroids and kind of flip things on its head to derive physical properties of the asteroid from what people measured rather than usually people figure out what they measured from something anyway you go into the details but it was cool it was asteroids it was planetary defense it was great uh ucla there's a group at ucla that's doing a seti project and uh, has been involving the public and in, uh, in a citizen science project to learn the um, uh, to help get rid of the earth interference because that's a the real one of the big problems in radio SETI is not surprisingly humans are making all sorts of radio interference and try and categorize that and then teach machine learning to then use the humans figure things out and then and categorize and then the machine learning learns from what they learned and then you have a happy little system that goes much faster and you have a lot fewer uh False, po false positives are things that need to be pursued, and you can really focus on the smaller set that does need to be pursued. Anyway, I can keep going. We've got, we've got the uh, right now, probably certainly over these months, they've, they've, been, they've been growing dogs, and it's super cute, but it has nothing to do with step grant program. They've there. We've got a at Florida Institute of Technology lead, leading a project with. Uh, Growing, comparing growing plants for human consumption, things like tomatoes and, and lettuce uh, in uh, hydroponics or in regolith, the upper, it's not soil, but the equivalent of soil on the surface of the moon or Mars and trying to figure out what plants grow better. What basically looking farther in the future, trying to figure out the best way to be, make, become more self-sufficient in human space exploration and then finally yes space salads and salty waters 
uh, a project, that, and you can read all about it and get all the names I haven't been dropping, and I apologize. Uh, Salty Waters is we're funding the, there's all these grants to do analysis of, of, um, of salt, different ty types of salt, not just table salt, covered lakes in uh, Canada, in Western Canada and likening those to some that might have been on Mars at one point, or even subsurface versions in some of the ice worlds farther out and, and learning that. But no one had, it was hard for them to get funding to actually do the field trip, to take people to Canada with their instruments and study stuff. And so that's what we funded and uh, they're, they're doing great work. And you can find more information in all of those links that are being thrown up, including uh, I'm not thrown up, and then uh, including the um, link to STEP in general. And Shoemaker Neo, you can learn what they're doing. Uh, and so we've got another Shoemaker Neo is coming up. We'll have an announcement in a few uh, the in January of a new round round of Shoemaker Neo grants, and we'll select later in the year, and then the following year we'll do STEP grants. So we're starting in. We we pushed a couple quickly on STEP grants uh, rounds to kickstart it. Not litter, not that kickstart. And then uh, we uh, will do them every other year. So we'll have Shoemaker Neo and then Step and Shoemaker Neo and Step. And basically, uh, the whole time I will just ramble, babble, and talk incoherently. And uh, meanwhile, there are I coherent can... words coming from Matt and from the links that Amber is providing. I can help with the uh, coherence there, I hope. You folks, and... I hope, realize since you're all members. You're the ones who make all of this possible. You are behind these grant programs, and I am so proud of them. Um, you know, I love all of the STEP grant projects that have been funded already, especially, I got to say, because I love SETI. And we have such a wonderful history, the society does, with SETI. You know, if you come to our headquarters, you will see the pictures of a young Steven Spielberg throwing a big fake knife switch to turn on the meta receiver a million simultaneous channels being monitored sounds like a lot it's nothing compared to what they do now but back then it was a very big deal and uh, i just love that we are still involved in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence but you know when you look at it by their nature these programs you know you wouldn't expect the step grants to suddenly result in in some absolutely wonderful uh, bit of wow. achievement I'm sorry Necessarily. Amber is on it. Boom. There's a picture really of Steven is. Look at that. There is the photo. You were saying something profound, Matt, and I, I actually feel bad. That's all right. I'm glad you pointed out. I might have missed it. There's the found one the co-founder, Dr. Sagan, with Steven Spielberg holding one of his young children. I love that photo. I whenever I give the tour, it's a highlight. So um, but it's really the shoemaker Neo that you can point to and say look at the results from this program yeah. look at the discoveries and and refinement of our knowledge of near earth objects that has come out of our funding of these amateur and some professional astronomers around the world yeah yeah no we've uh, we've funded uh i didn't look at my statistics we've had more than 70 grants over more than 25 years uh, to uh 23 i think countries around the world mm. on all the continents but antarctica and they do as matt said they they do a great job uh it started when they were doing a lot of discovery and then the professional surveys started doing that more and so it really picked up and became more emphasizing the follow-up the hours and hours of great telescope time you need to figure out that dot that you discovered moving a little where is it now? Where is it now? Where is it now? And now we can figure out whether it's going to hit Earth, which is kind of what we care about, uh, at least the first order. And then um, doing just characterization. So there are some of them work uh, with professional astronomers and on their own uh, determining things like what, which of these asteroids are actually binary asteroids, because we actually wanted to deflect one or just in general to learn about the asteroid population. Uh, it, it's uh, We're finding about 15% of them are two yeah. asteroids, not one. Uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And there are the facts. Shoemaker Grant Award Program by the numbers. You can uh, review this uh, success that uh, Bruce has just been describing. 
We are just past the halfway point in this hour. I have not seen, I told everybody, throw questions at us. Put them up in chat. And uh, uh, I, got, I can like ask you questions. questions. You, can, you could, yeah, I could ask. I have lots of questions. You could. You. Um, <laughs> I, could. I would rather get them from the members. And so it doesn't have to be about the solar system. It can be beyond, <laughs> because Bruce just loves to talk about cosmology. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's just review my, my spiel that uh, probably everyone has heard. <laughs> the reason I became a planetary scientist, because cosmology hurt my brain. I like places that I can picture. I, I did planetary surfaces. I could picture standing on them. I wasn't going to be there, but I could picture standing on Mars, even standing on Europa. Uh, but you get to giant planets, and you get to weird black hole stuff. And I mean, it's fascinating. It's weird, but... Um, not going to happen. Didn't Planets. you? Uh, did, I, but I, I have mean, written about them. Your mentor, your advisor, when you were in grad school yes. at Caltech, the much beloved and fondly remembered Bruce Murray, our co one of our other co founders, um, didn't he ride you a little bit? Because I don't know. I, I guess, I mean, he was one of the first real planetary scientists, right? But yeah. uh, I, so I guess he probably didn't like push you into want to push you sideways into cosmology or anything no. like that no i, I guess not. Oh you are so quick you Amber. Amber. There's, it's spooky. there's bruce there's bruce uh, yeah sideburns um uh no he didn't and in fact, anyway not important but he's a planetary guy planetary. let me start we are getting some questions now here's one from mark uh, local news ran a short piece on 2024 PT5. What did they probably get wrong? I didn't even hear of this one. Is this was, did, was, did we have a recent flyby? Is this one you're familiar with? Uh, all I know, uh, my guess is it's the one that didn't even have that. I didn't even see that designation that might, might, might get bright at the end of October, different than 2023 A. Three, et cetera, et cetera, which is possibly getting bright or maybe not in a few days. Uh, but if I'm wrong, uh, put into the chat what it is. I will avoid looking it up right now and just go with I don't know. I'll but I can tell you that if uh, if it's uh, oh I did yeah I think so I think that is what it's, anyway it's um the I can bluff by talking about something else which is uh, actually not bluffing it's just it's just not the question which is the designation is an indicator of when it was discovered so 2024 <laughs> is the year sorry about the dogs no i'm not uh and 2024 year is the dogs and then uh, no i'm kidding 2024 pt5 oh here we go the next close pass yeah january 2025 yeah. Sorry. Uh, PT5P would indicate we, when it was discovered, it would have, would have been discovered very recently um, because they started with A and then for the first half of January and B the second half of January. And then they had letters for which one was discovered. And then it gets even more complicated. So they're so darn good at discovering things now. Well, that was, um, embarrassing. That was an embarrassing start. Let's try again. <laughs> Let's try a different one. What, in your opinion, says Jeremy, is the most effective way to get people to look up to bring the night sky into their realm? Oh, I think it depends on the people. Uh, from a very personal standpoint, I'll start there because that's kind of where I started. That's actually where random space facts came from. And easy night sky information was just telling people that when you're out or, you know, hey, there's Saturn. There's Jupiter, and even that, uh, even for those like I had a neighbor back, way back when who started all that because he was short attention span science was all I could get. That was the coolest thing ever that that was Jupiter. And then one minute later, it's like, hey, what's the dog doing? Uh, hey, what's that leaf? Um, and so that that's one end of the spectrum. But I think we are trying to do a lot of those things, and we are encouraging you to do them by having training courses and things to, depending on what you want to do. Uh, to talk to and get people excited. So I think it's important to hit a lot of different mediums, media, 
these days, and certainly our communications group, uh, which you and Amber are part of, are doing that from everything from podcasts uh, to uh, videos to uh, different streams, different this, different that, and trying to, it depends on the person is the answer. Mm -hmm. And writing things like this, hopefully, gets them started young and gets them interested in a lifetime way, just like Matt and I got interested uh, when we were young. Do you remember the first thing you saw through a telescope? Gosh, I want to make a joke. Um, <laughs> Other, not earthbound, not through your neighbor's window. First thing I saw through a telescope. To, um, I have other very clear memories. So I, I have a very clear memory of looking at the moon with just my eyes when Apollo astronauts were on the moon. So I remember that Thank was you. very profound. Um, I was lucky enough to see from a distance the Apollo 17 launch, and then I had someone uh, in the public press office a distant, oh, I got a tisk tisk, uh, and in a, a distant, that's very distracting for me, I'm sorry, a uh, dis, distant cousin who worked at JPL who used to send me pictures back in the days when hard copy, mm -hmm. uh, he knew I was interested in planets, so I got Viking and Voyager little packets of their press release pictures. And that just, uh, I was just enamored with, with that. So, no, I don't remember the first thing I saw through a telescope. I remember the first time I saw Saturn through a telescope. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, my gosh, it's the rings, which is often what people do. It's very, very tiny because it's a very, very small telescope, but the rings. And then later I figured out that's really weird because it's like a billion miles, a billion and a half kilometers away. And you can see the rings. And uh, we know that they're not candles or ears or anything that some of the creative uh, original solutions to the rings were. I, kind of, uh, I know that for me it was, either, it was either the moon or Saturn. Uh, but I remember how amazed I was the first time I looked through my very poor, I think two and a half inch refractor, a Tasco, uh, at Saturn and saw exactly yeah, what it's special. Saw. Yeah, and it was exactly as you described it. I mean, you could easily see how Galileo would have confused it, those things right. coming out of it as, as cup handles. Uh, and uh, it just blew me away. And probably, I'm sure like you, you it, like you've gotten those pictures probably from uh, your cousin. We had seen far better images coming out of the telescopes at the time and the missions at the time. Uh, but there's just something about that light coming directly from the planet through those lenses and into yeah. your eye there's just nothing like it this is true this is true I, um, although i'm a big fan of those up close and personal spacecraft images uh but the yeah the, the telescope experience as any amateur astronomer will tell you is uh it's different yeah you're, you're more connected Here's one from Gregory, taking us in another, into another one of your departments. Hello all, a question from a persistent space amateur. When light sail sailed, he put in quotes, did I read that it was able to use solar winds to redirect its trajectory? In other words, can we now use solar sailing in space to steer? There's a whole bunch in there you can unpack for us. <laughs> Yeah, let's start with the misnomer, uh, which is unfortunate that it exists, which is it, uh, solar sails don't use solar wind. That would make far too much sense uh, because then our analogy to sailboats would be perfect in terms of terminology. Uh, it, I mean, technically they do, but the solar wind is a much, much, which is the charged particles coming out of the sun, much smaller amount of push, strangely than light itself. So it's the solar radiation pressure or just the light, the sunlight that pushes on the, uh, or does the majority of the pushing on the sails. And uh, we did indeed demonstrate uh, that you can steer these and you can do it in space. Now we did it around Earth because that was the practical solution, but also kind of the hardest in terms of a steering algorithm because uh, you're, it's just like sailing in a harbor instead of out in the deep ocean. You have to keep turning, you have to keep tacking. And, uh, but on the other hand, you don't have all the communications and innumerable other issues of going out 
uh, beyond Earth, and you can't use um, your university tracking station usually to to track it, um, which we did. So, uh, but we did then demonstrate for small spacecraft. Uh, the Japanese space agency with Icaros in 2010 demonstrated the ability to fly a solar sail when it was uh, dropped off on the by Akatsuki on its way to Venus. Uh, they had a much less steerable spacecraft, but they had all sorts of very clever, uh, the origami folds, the power and the way they tried to make the changes, but it, it was a spinning solar sail, so it inherently didn't want to rotate. Um, but that's okay because they did it in a different environment. So yeah, solar sails, I, there's still, I mean, I described what we did is, is kind of learning to crawl, maybe walk and stumble a little bit. It's, it's still early phases, but what LightSail 2 did, thanks to all of you, is it demonstrated two things. One, that you, we could do this and we could do all this steering, but also that we could do it in a small spacecraft like a CubeSat, which revolutionized uh, who's going into Earth orbit, including universities and, and others that can fly a tiny spacecraft as a piggyback. Uh, but this is a way you can get propulsion out in deep space. And so it, it demonstrated that was the case. And then it also just kind of raised the level of awareness of solar sailing as a viable, realistic alternative. Uh, and so uh, then others have said, uh, including at NASA, that that helped them get their proposals funded and their missions underway. Uh, there's one in orbit right now, I think, Hey, how about I pick up from Mark, uh, what's next for solar sailing? Yes, perfect segue. Because uh, it's up there right now and apparently doing okay. It, it, it deployed properly, didn't it? Uh, that is my understanding. Um, yes, uh, ACS-3, which has the worst name, we volunteered to try to change it. But ACS-3, which is a, a unpronounceable acronym, which is a pet peeve of mine. I love acronyms, but they need to be pronounceable, like STEP. Uh, is the uh, it's the something some advanced composite booms advanced composite uh, solar sail system is just in the thing that uh, it is, thank you ACS there are three S's hence the three ah, anyway okay. that's not important that I disagree, that's the only thing I disagree with they've gotten into space uh, they are flying they've opened a, a sail they're earth orbiting they're in a different higher orbit which is great we wish we had been in a higher orbit, so had less uh, atmospheric drag, but not a lot higher in terms of percentage. And they have, they very, did everything very methodically. So their big test is the booms. They're, they're, instead of using a metal alloy like we used, and we did have one of them mysteriously, we never solved why, bend when it came out. Uh, they have a composite boom that they feel is a better solution, especially for bigger sails. And that was the main thing to test. So after they they waited to deploy and then they deployed and they were very careful and methodical, they got it deployed and uh, I haven't, uh, I need to check on the latest update. They had not started controlled sailing last I knew, uh, but they were, that was on the horizon. They were studying and imaging their uh, their booms and the like so that's a nasa mission that one run by ames research center and langley research center that uh, continued on we shared information with that they used that our engineers talked to them uh, i served on the final review panel uh, for it and then uh, you had the very sad nia scout uh, experience which was the near-earth asteroid scout uh, run by Les Johnson at Marshall Space Flight Center with various other centers involved. And they were going to go out and head past the moon and actually try to get to Earth Sun L1 demonstration. Anyway, uh, sadly, they after deployment, they lost communication. So before you ever got to the sailing part, you once again saw, oh, space is hard. So uh, that was a shame. There also is uh, another, there's some technology they're working on, others are working on. So we're getting there, but it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's like any new technology, especially in space. It's a, it's a challenge. Do I have a movie for you to see? Yesterday, I treated myself. Uh, my, my wife and grandson had gone to see at the local IMAX, uh, on the local IMAX screen at the uh, Fleet Science Center, free uh, plug for them. Ruben H. Fleet. Ruben H. Fleet. They went to see a new IMAX film called Cities of the Future. 
to my enormous surprise, because it really was about engineering of all sorts. Um, they show a solar power satellite, but it wasn't like any solar power satellite I'd ever seen. It was really 30 or 40 solar power satellites flying very close to each other as a kind of flotilla, and they were solar sails. And they deployed just like, as far as you know, my untrained eye, right. light sail too. Have you seen it? It's great. They, they're they all yeah. unfurled and they catch the sun and then they generate microwaves with the photovoltaic cells and beam them down to earth and solve all of our energy problems, which is what the National Space Society has been pushing for, oh, I don't know, 50 years. And, yeah. um, uh, but it was so great to see that they had been inspired, yeah, no doubt, by the deployment of and maybe the animations of our own light sail. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I remind people that that's the, the future. And so I'm kind of a stickler for let's kind of figure out what's in the near term, what's the far term. That's a far term, really cool, quite possible. But the amount of technology you have to and things you have to get right just to fly a formation of any kind of spacecraft. Anyway, I, I'm being my usual, um, I believe it's called the wet blanket, uh, real stuff. This is good. Bring us yeah, down to Earth. Uh, my, I'm going to bring you down to Earth just like that atmosphere brought us down to Earth. But, oh. uh, uh, listen, it fired up, the atmosphere fired up. It was ugly. We got a few minutes left, folks. We need more questions. Remember, you can ask us anything. ABA, ask Bruce anything. And uh, we will push it out or there. Amber's already that's the problem. link to Cities of the Future. But yes, what? what, 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 what? I think uh, maybe they just aren't interested in me as much. I think they should ask you questions, man. I, I have one for you. Who do you want to have play you in the movie? <laughs> uh, well, I'll need different people at different ages, of course. But, uh, <laughs> I, I suppose, although they can do wonders with CGI. Brad Pitt and I are similar in age. He does look older, but... Uh, I don't know. Probably not good looking enough. Yeah, it's true. But I mean, what are you going to do? Several people are typing, says the community to me. <laughs> so we will watch for those and uh, let you know. <laughs> just, thank you, Craig, for we were just enthralled by, yeah, by all the information flowing out. Ah, they're, they're, they're just sitting like this and, and, and loving this stuff. I'm enjoying it, too. It does just as I expected it I, would. Actually, I'm I was, just kidding. I know exactly the actor, and I should have said it first. Brendan Fraser. Fraser. Brendan Fraser. Brendan Fraser. Absolutely right. We've talked about that, haven't we? That, that yes, just, because you, sometimes yeah. people think part of my me looks like Brendan Fraser. Yeah. Um, I'm trying not to look like Brendan Fraser in Whale, well, but, you know getting closer uh but it, but yeah brendan fraser uh, definitely <laughs> no doubt still Maybe says several that. several people are typing oh here you go greg gregory says okay i can ask anything the persistent amateur wants to know i am an urban planner and urban designer by profession got to see this movie uh, cities of the future gregory uh, aside from musk and his mars city very properly placed quote marks this time. Has anyone in the know proposed possible designs, shapes, technologies for actual Mars moon colonies? The answer is yes. Uh, I've met some of these folks, but but Bruce, uh, your, Mars, your concepts for a Mars colony. This one goes back to you. This is off that, that far future. It's, uh, it's not like black holes, but it still hurts my brain. <laughs> yeah, there have been no. a there have been a lot of concepts, uh, particularly, of course, for just like research stations. But there have been a there's been a lot of work done on how would you build a viable colony. Uh, we talked about uh, one of them, uh, one concept, with Bob Zubrin when we talked to him about his recent book, which, of course, because I am so terrible at titles and I can't see it on the bookshelf over there. Um, but Bob definitely talks about this in his book and has some rather amazing concepts for building a Mars colony where you could actually be hopefully protected from radiation and have a swell time. Um, but uh, I don't remember the name of the book. But if you look in our archives at planetary.org. Direct again? No, it's not. <laughs> Make it's Mars not. direct. I can tell you what it's not. Great again? 
I think it's, uh, there it is. I knew Amber would come up with it. I just didn't want to force it on her. The New World on Mars. It is provocative uh, because I don't think Bob can speak without being provocative, but it's quite a fascinating book. And uh, some of you probably heard that conversation. But there are many other people. There have been competitions uh, for professional designers uh, uh, to design habitats for Mars and beyond that uh, cities and colonies. And uh, it's all out there for you to find. Uh, probably just Google uh, or with your search engine of choice, um, Mars Colony, Mars City concept, and you will come across a whole bunch of this stuff. Uh, Craig says, not to be confused with a city on Mars. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, oh, and 3D printed habitat challenge. Something we actually covered uh, for the Planetary Society. Amber has popped up a link to it. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, it's a NASA thing, but this was part of the NASA competition. I've met some of the people who participated in that competition. In fact, I've met the winner a couple of times. Absolutely fascinating designer and, and pretty amazing work and stuff that can be applied uh, on terra firma as well, like the 3D built buildings by giant 3D um, printers. And those also appear in this IMAX film, which I saw yesterday, Cities of the Future. They show you a structure being built by a, a, a 3D printer, a giant 3D printer. So there you go. Uh, let's see, I think my next ink is gonna have to be have a swell time on Mars, says Mark. <laughs> All right, I'm just, I, I'm gonna have to throw a question at you myself. Unless we see more, pop them up there, folks, because we still have another five minutes at least. If we get enough, we'll go longer. Um, you, of course, cover Uranus and Neptune, and that is the correct uh, pronunciation of uh, Uranus, of course. As my one and only astronomy professor said, this is not an anatomy class. Uh, Uranus and Neptune, which, as you mentioned in the books, we have only visited one time a single one of the Voyagers. Uh, how do you feel about getting out there again? Uh, I feel really great, uh, but I think we should send you instead, man. Sure, I'll go for no, the round trip. I would love to go out there, and again, being a, I, I, I enjoy atmospheric people and uh, interiors people, and uh, they would love to get out there for, the, for Uranus and Neptune. I would love to have us get out there for the moons. Uh, which are pretty darn cool, and the other, the rings, but also for the, the planets. I mean, they're, they're some, they're funky. Neptune's got the strongest winds that we've <laughs> measured in the solar system. That's weird. It's really far from the sun and the energy source. Uranus, of course, tilted on its side. It's got a, a magnetic field that shifted like a, th a third of the way out from the center of the planet, the generation of kind of the dipole. Anyway, weird places. Triton, at Neptune, which we're not going to get to for a very long time, super cool. Uh, nitrogen geysers, we flew by once, and, and there were enough geyser action of nitrogen geysers that we saw them. Uh, I mean, that is cantaloupe train. I mean, what what's not to love? I mean, whether you love the fruit or not, with the melon, uh, it looks like a, what the? It's a, there's a whole lot of what the. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll tell a... a, a, a I'll tell a story since we don't have questions. Uh, I was in grad school uh, at Caltech when, way back when, when Voyager flew past uh, Neptune, mm -hmm. and there was a planet fest by the Planetary Society, which I went to, and they were pulling up pictures as they came down, or shortly after they came down, and I was feeling pretty good. I'd put in a couple of years of grad school at Caltech, and those I just remember those pictures of Triton came up, and I'm like, I'm I got nothing. <laughs> I apparently know nothing because I what is going on with that, that cantaloupe terrain? I, I thought I had a handle on things and then it's like it just broke me. Like, oh, hey, right. you weren't alone. Uh, ain't science but, grand. Uh, but the flip side was when it's like, but that's what's so cool about planetary science and, and astronomy in general and science in general, which is you, you, you're always getting surprised. And everywhere every time we go somewhere new or every time we go back, with better instrumentation, you're surprised. And you're also testing the, the hypotheses you had before. But then there's those weird things like geysers and cantaloupe train. You're going, wow, 
we didn't even get a very good look at all the small the moons the shakespearean moons of uh of uranus well, and alexander pope that's who they're they're named after their characters so anyway miranda uh, i do want to say you know the 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 descriptive subtitles for each book Uranus, the sideways planet, Neptune, planet of wind and ice. Um, maybe we'll ra wrap up with this. Um, what's your favorite planet? <laughs> I actually, unlike children, I think I, I can tell you my favorite planet. Uh, it is Mars. I have a long relationship with Mars. And why? Because Mars is the most Earth-like of the planets and yet so very different. So it's like that that balance that you have, and you have such a difference between modern Mars, dry, thin atmosphere, water is only ice and uh, and a gas, and we're uh, just an aside, dry ice, uh, polar caps. I mean that's that's pretty cool. The winter caps, uh, and then you go back in time, and you've got these huge giant flood channels. You've got rivers. You've got deltas. You've got this totally different history, which we're gradually piecing together by flying these incredible uh, engineering masterpieces to orbit and to the surface. And so it's just cool. It's not, and, and plus, probably most importantly, my favorite color is red. <laughs> now, what's your favorite color? Wait, see if I can remember. I can't. Blue. Blue. Green. No, green. I, I, uh, <laughs> uh, it says right here, from Gregory, to all of you doing these fantastic webcasts, especially Amber, thank you, thank you, great job. Uh, thank you, all of you, for uh, for joining us for this uh, latest edition of the Book Club. Again, the series is from the Planetary Society. They are written by our guest author this evening, Bruce Betts, and uh, they are available in the usual places from Learner Publishing, from that website, also from Amazon, and uh, hopefully soon in your local school library. I highly recommend them. You can do what I did and pretend that you're getting them for your grandson or child and uh, uh, enjoy them yourself because they are, they are fun to read and uh, I learn stuff and I've been looking out at the planets for a long, long time. Uh, thank you, Amber. Yes. Uh, and if you're so interested and inspired, help uh, get them out there more talk to your school and other libraries uh, about getting them and uh, also if you get them and you look at them and you and well whatever you think of them uh, please consider leaving a review on Amazon because that's what helps kick up the uh, the people going to it and uh, and that helps the planetary society but it also helps the children help the children <laughs> uh, hey we do have one last question and it comes from James, happens to be one of my three brothers. What is the flight velocity of a Leighton Sparrow? The oh, correct see, answer, I think, is, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, not a... Oh, and Craig said African or European. Absolutely right, Craig. And the wizard is thrown into the chasm. You got to see... Uh, you Monty Python, Python fans. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, there is another link to the book on Amazon, or one of the books, if not all of them. Thank you, everybody. A reminder that on Saturday at 8 p.m. Pacific, I will be under the dome of the 60-inch telescope, once the largest telescope in the world, on this planet anyway, on top of Mount Wilson. It looks like it's going to be a clear night. I will be there with our wonderful leader of Southern California volunteers, Gio Somoza, and Tim Russ, who was recently promoted to Admiral, Admiral Tuvok. But a lot of you know, Tim Russ is a, an actual, very highly skilled amateur astronomer as well. We will be up there. We will show you if, if we get it to work, uh, what can be seen through the eyepiece of the 60 inch telescope. And we'll talk to some of the other folks who join us up there for a night of observing this Saturday, 8 p.m. Pacific, right here in your member community. Thank you for making all of this possible. Bruce, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, thank man. You. Thanks, everyone, who joined us. Thank you for the books, and uh, thank you for being a buddy for, uh, oh, I don't know, two and a half decades. You too, man. 
It seems like just no. It seems like a really long time. It does. It does. A really good time. Really good time. Good to be back hanging out with you, uh, doing the video thing and uh, and being silly. Let's do it again when you're not riding. All right, party on. (laughs) All right, everybody. Uh, Bruce, don't forget to exit on your own, even though I'm going to do it from here. Otherwise, you'll probably have to hang around for a few seconds, and you can tell people while I'm gone how you really feel. Bye, everybody. No, get me out. (laughs) 